Hello everyone and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. I am your host Nick Henning and apologies that I haven't been posting too much lately but I have been uh, pretty busy with a couple things. I'm starting a new job. Not that that affects you but it does affect me. Uh, so today we are going to switch into actually talking uh, a little bit about just theory, general gaming theory. And what I want to talk about today is cooperating in competitive games. So uh, I am a big advocate of playing four-player games. If you, if you watched any of my Frosthaven videos, you know I play that two-player. I like playing cooperative games two-player. But in general, when I'm playing a competitive game, I really prefer to play four or more player games. I do like playing two-player games, competitive two-player games, and I think that they're essentially... Every two-player game is, is, as far as I'm concerned, a functionally whole different genre of, of gaming than four-player games. They use the same rules and systems, but really the dynamics that are play are just very, very different. Uh, even in games where you are doing functionally the same thing, I, I think the dynamics tend to be very different in four versus two-player games or multiplayer versus two-player games. The large reason for that is that two-player games are zero-sum, right? Everything that you don't get is something that I do get. And I find that because I am good at looking at those things, I tend to play a little bit more on the kind of mean or cutthroat side when I'm playing a two-player game. And uh, frankly, the reality is that I'm a little bit of a, a softy emotionally. Like I'll do those things to, to win the game, but I would prefer to play a game where I'm trying to uh, rising tide all boats uh, and try to, to do the best possible. So I'm actually a big fan of your sort of like multiplayer solitaire type things. But what I want to talk about today are games that are not multiplayer solitaire games. Um, instead, I want to talk about games that do interact with other players at the table. And I want to make a case for why you should be interested in cooperating with your fellow players in a multiplayer game if it's possible. In order to do this, um, I thought about a few specific games that we could talk about, but frankly, I think that I would get too into the weeds about the one specific game. So what I did is I've made up a game and uh, we've got four players here, yellow, red, green, and blue. And uh, the numbers that you see on the top or bottom are going to represent essentially these players' current scores. So everybody's current scores are at three. And we're going to suppose a game where players throughout the course of the game can just gain or lose points. That's it. That's the whole game. Um, it's not going to be terribly interesting. And for most of the examples I'm going to be talking about today, we're going to focus on, you know, someone winning when they get to 10 points, let's say. Um, the middle section here of my little diagram is going to indicate essentially the action that I'm talking about. So in this example here on the left, right? I actually am <laughs> so bad with mirrored screens. On the side, um, we're going to see that yellow, you know, in this action that we're positing, yellow is going down a point to two, red is going up a point to four, and green is going up a point to four. So that's basically the model of what it is that we are going to be working with today. Let's start with a boring statement. Getting points is good, right? So in this instance, where yellow, who's going to be our focus player, because yellow is usually the color that I play, um, Getting one point increases yellow's position from three to four. In almost all circumstances, this is good. There are some very few games, I guess like Munchkin, where there's sort of a, a kill the carrier kind of mechanic where you don't want to be in the lead. Um, we're not really going to focus on that too, too much in this uh, video, but it is obviously something that you need to pay attention to in those social dynamics. That could be a video entirely of its own. Uh, but let's just say for now that getting a point is awesome. The real question here is whether getting a point and giving your opponents a point is awesome. And I think most players already kind of know that the answer to this is obviously yes. Um, in this instance where suppose I'm taking an action and I get a point, but by me getting a point, I also give red a point. Um, this is almost always going to be an action that I am going to take in the course of the game. It puts me up against my green and blue opponents. Both red and I are now in an advantage position compared to those opponents. And maybe I wouldn't do this with like social dynamics or something like that. But again, we're going to focus just on the points side of things when you would or wouldn't do this. As a general rule of thumb, this is going to be an action that I'm going to take because I am putting myself up against some other opponents, and then hopefully I can find some other edges in the game to beat out red along the way. This action is a little bit more suspicious, though, and I think in general it should be, in, in, in the case that I've presented here, this is a mostly ambivalent situation. I do not care if I'm taking an action that gives everybody a point or doesn't give everybody a point. Um, 
bird like there's a lot of birds and wingspan that do things like this right everybody gets to do one thing and those things might be exactly equal with each other in a lot of games the question about when you're doing everybody gets something actions is do you get something better than the other people uh and you know you'll see that a lot when it's like everybody gets something but you get to draft the selected item first so presumably the, the bonuses are are true for you but there's a lot of games that also exist out there where everybody gets a point and in general this isn't something that you're interested in doing there are situations though where you do care about this action here's an example where actually getting one point for every player has actually and probably improved my position in the course of this game everybody's getting one point there's no delta you know there's no delta meaning the term for how much i get over someone else there's no delta difference more than what i'm giving to other players as what i have but this is still a favorable action in my current position because i'm getting closer to closing out the game if we had the opportunities to just kind of repeatedly take this plus one points for every player um, until the end of the game. I'm going to win because I'm going to hit 10 well before the other players. It's not a whole lot of rocket science to say that this is a situation where I wouldn't want this to be happening because if everybody's getting a point at this place, I am just losing, you know, I'm, I'm behind other players. I stay behind other players. So everybody getting a point when I'm behind is fundamentally a problem. So that's actually something that I think is really important to understand in this like cooperating aspect. When you are ahead, the more everybody cooperates, the better off you are. Um, in fact, the, it's it's something that like as the game is played pleasantly, essentially, um, or multiplayer solitaire type games, People that are ahead tend to continue snowball and being ahead um, unless there's a way for folks to break that parity. Whereas when you're behind, you know, you need to find a way for this system to be completely broken down. Going back to our one point for us, one point for red situation, it gets a little bit more complicated based on the state of the game. Um, in this instance right here, I am putting red into a leading position, but I'm also closing the gap between myself and the green and blue players. In an instance like this, where we're still pretty far away from the end of the game, uh, but I am getting closer to the green and blue players, they might have an incentive to kind of slow the red player down or maybe give me points because I'm in a losing position. Um, this is an action that I almost always would take uh, under these kinds of circumstances. This circumstance is basically the same situation except for we're much closer to the end of the game and you could argue that essentially what I'm doing here is king making. Um, I haven't actually made this person the winner of the game yet, but I'm definitely putting them in the position to be exactly there. The only instances I think where you're kind of taking this sort of action is where you know that you can stall out the red player. You're probably doomed in this example, right? If I'm at one point and everybody else is at eight, it kind of depends on the systems of the game. Is there any possible way for me to catch up? But me getting one point and giving one point to red, there's just too much of a gap there um, for it to 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 be a pretty reasonable choice that I'm gonna be making. Uh, but it does depend a lot on the systems of the game. So while this, my default instinct is, eh, I'm not gonna do this kind of difference here. Um, it is something that is going to make me pause and think. Now, that's, what I'm trying to get at here is that there, I think there's something very interesting about sort of the absolute value of the scores that players are at, how close are we to the end of the game based on those absolute values, particularly if it is a point racing game like the one that I'm positing here, um, and also just the relative value, right, the delta that I mentioned earlier. So uh, when I am cooperating with other players, I have to ask myself the position of what position they are in and in fact i would argue that this is i mean for me this is why i love four player games it's why i love complicated games trying to figure out how powerful a player's position is in the game i think is a really good reflection of a player's understanding of the board state the situation and i do think is a really great skill testing ability so you know while this very simple example um, you might be able to think about, well, what would I do in these circumstances? Those circumstances might be a little bit more opaque when you're playing something like, say, a Feast of Odin. Feast of Odin for Odin. Maybe we're not eating the guy. So let's talk about losing points. And I think in general, a lot of players intuitively have this, un intuitively have this understanding that if everybody is going down one point, it's kind of the same as me going up one point. Now, this is pretty bad design, not really common in a lot of modern points racing games. The reason being that 
game designers understand that we want to be moving towards a conclusion rather than away from a conclusion. So you don't come across this circumstance very much where you can hurt all opponents equally but hurting all opponents equally is in in you know relative at you know terms of the game a good thing for you right like you, this puts you at a at a better situation than your opponents it is basically the same as scoring one point uh it just it makes the game end up going longer rather than shorter which might change the dynamics of whatever it is that's going on Similarly, putting an, one single opponent down a point is generally going to be an action that you want to take as well. You are just relatively up on that other opponent. This isn't as good as the other situation, but by hurting your fellow players, you are putting yourself in a better position. Really green and blue are quite happy to see this action exist here um, because I've now made the choice to put red down to two points. All three of us are better off uh, compared to red's position. Now, Obviously, in real games, it's a lot more complicated than this. When you are targeting everybody, folks don't tend to take it personally. When you're targeting one person, folks do tend to take it personally. And so those concepts of retaliation, the social dynamics that exist in a game, this is a game where I can clearly take something away from someone else. So is it possible for them to come and take something back from me? Might be a situation in which putting that person down a point is actually not a net zero for you it will come back and haunt you in the long run i don't feel like i need to work that hard to convince you that you going down a point and one opponent going down a point is one of the worst things that you could absolutely do um, you are just helping out green and blue and this is a situation that you look at right now and you say yeah in this game like of course i wouldn't do this but you see this dynamic take place all the time in games there are so many game designs out there that essentially in order for you to take down a person you have to slow yourself down now you might not slow yourself down as much as your opponent and we'll get to that in just a second but this dynamic of essentially like a, a, a mutual destruction or mutual uh, debilitation is very common in gaming and i think it's something that folks underplay for some reason you know they they notice that they can do it in the game it's a game mechanism and they don't think about necessarily the consequences that it has to themselves and um, for for games where folks are thinking about that and those mechanics do exist we don't have this kind of like push pull that that should exist i think game designers need to be very wary of why a person would not choose to interact with this game system they've put in that allows us to harm each other in the game but the reason that it is put into a game, and I'm looking at you, Cole Worley, is because when players have this situation where someone is absolutely, right, their score is running away with the game. And when I say absolutely, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I mean, in absolute terms, their actual number of points um, is getting close to broaching the end of the game. Um, taking them down a significant peg may be worth slowing ourselves down. Now, this still isn't really that ideal because you kind of have what's a buck passing responsibility here. I don't want to take this action, but I want green and blue to take this action. So maybe we have a table social dynamic where green, blue, and I have all agreed that we're going to take this to slow red down. But I find that a lot of times those kinds of deals break down. These kinds of things end up being buck passed to the next person. And then what happens is either the last person in order you know, essentially accepts the the grenade. They jump on the grenade to hurt the leader um, along the way, or they say, well, you know what? Screw it. I'll just let them win. These I kill you and I suffer for it concepts struggle in a lot of the circumstances I've posited, but this is sort of the ideal. This is I functionally, I would argue how the game root works. Um, the person that is in lead, if they can be slowed down by the person that is in second place, that is the ideal game balancing mechanism because green and blue now have the opportunity to catch up a little bit. The responsibility should fall to the person in second place because after this change, yellow has improved their standing not in absolute terms. They don't have the highest score, but in terms of relative percentile of score of the other players. Red was in, you know, punting distance of getting to 10 points. Um, but now at six, red's still quite a ways away. And yellow, yes, they've slowed down a little bit, but they're not much worse than they were before. And now they can try to uh, use the rest of the game to take advantage of the situation that red is in. 
sort of the key aspect I would argue of this confrontational aspect of the game is that you should hit other players when the opportunity cost for you is low. So in this relatively more complex situation, Yellow has the opportunity to knock a few other players down a peg, not necessarily knocking down another player, the green player, but the green player in this situation is in last. And so actually what we're doing is just sort of bringing the game closer together, which gives Yellow the opportunity to maybe take more um, advantages or use more diplomacy or whatever it is throughout the course of the rest of the game to close that gap. Whereas when they were in the situation of being in third place, just kind of a clear third place at six points, it felt like the game win was a little bit more out of reach for them. Now, of course, I've spent all this time talking about confrontational stuff. Let's talk about cooperating a little bit more. Now, hopefully earlier in the video, I convinced you that giving myself and one other player a point is generally going to be a good situation in the game unless we're approaching the end of the game or the player I'm giving a point to is about to win. But I want to prove to you that I think cooperating is just so incredibly powerful in four player games using this example. I want to posit a situation where I am giving myself one point and giving my opponent two points. Now this seems on surface quite bad. Yes, I'm putting myself up against green and blue, but I am putting red, who was tied with me previously, into a very clear lead here by giving them two points. If I took this action repeatedly, I would just be handing red the game. Um, this isn't only a uh, king-making action. It is just straight up an insane action because I have cost myself the circumstances in this game. However, there are a lot of games where you want to be taking this kind of action constantly. I'm going to suggest a game where we are starting with the yellow player and on your turn you can either pass or score. Um, if you score, you will score just one point um, unless someone else has passed. If someone else has passed, you're going to score two points. Uh, but then the people who passed are going to score the number of points equal to uh, four, just, just the number of people that have passed essentially or just they'll score one point. So. <laughs> so you get two they get one um so in this instance yellow chooses to pass they score no points on their turn and red then chooses to score because they're going to get two points and two points is better than not scoring any points they presume so they're going to get two points going up to five and yellow is going to get one point going up to four but green now takes the action and they go up two points and yellow goes up to five and then blue does exactly the same thing. They go up two points and yellow being the passing player scores one. Now in this instance where yellow did not choose to score points on their turn, they actually just scored on red, green, and blue's turns. Every single individual action was not as beneficial to yellow as it was for the other players, but because it happened on every single player's turn, Yellow over the course of this turn has scored three points while the other players have scored two points. Now you might be saying this is obviously a ridiculous scenario that I've come up with, but I would argue that it actually isn't. There are so many stock games in the world, 18xx and friends like that, and a lot of them operate on exactly this principle. Um, the idea that if you get involved, you stick your fingers in the pies of your other players, um, you have the opportunity to essentially draft off of the hard work that they're doing. Now every game has different systems for how many points players are going to be getting for doing this and that. So it's not as simple as just saying, oh yeah, copy what your opponents are doing and you'll get points behind them. But really this principle does apply to a ton of games, a ton of Euros especially, and especially stock market games. Um, by paying attention to what it is that your players are doing, you have the opportunity to score additional points along the way. And yes, your game plan might by itself not be necessarily as powerful, but by cooperating with the other players or just paying attention to what it is that they're doing and kind of trying to draft off their coattails a little bit, you can put yourself into a very advantageous position. And this is primarily what I'm talking about when I'm saying I think it's very valuable to consider cooperating in multiplayer games paying attention to those circumstances, scoring in the situations where they're setting up big, powerful scoring opportunities for them. And you say, yeah, I'm not going to get quite as much as you are, but I'll get a chunk of what you're doing. And so many Euro game designs operate on exactly this principle. This plus one point, plus two points doesn't just apply to stock market games either. It applies as actually functionally a catch-up mechanism in games. This is the opposite of what I was positing with the um, 
with the take down the leader situation that it, that I um, suggested earlier with the kind of more confrontational setup. And this is the exact inverse of that concept. Suppose we have a situation where yellow's at three points, red's at seven, green's at six, blue's at five. On your turn, you can score one point or you can score two points and give one point to another player. Now, what yellow really should do is uh, take points and then give points to the third place player. But let's say that they are just so angry about being far behind yellow is just going to take one point on that turn that puts them up to four then red is going to take two points on their turn because they are interested in getting as close to the end of the game as possible so rather than taking one point and going to eight they'll take two points and go to nine for sure we already argued about that earlier in this video where we said if you're in the lead you absolutely want to help your fellow opponents um, getting more points because the closer you can get to the end of the game the closer you can close that puppy out um, that's going to be better for you so red takes those two points gives one point to yellow now yellow's up to five green they need to catch up and i put the wrong number here let me fix that they need to catch up so they're going to go to eight right from six to eight two points they're going to give one point to either blue or yellow in this instance let's just say that they choose to give it to yellow because blue is next to act and so yellow is going to go up to six points then and then blue they also want to catch up, so they're going to score two points, and they're not going to give it to green or red, so they'll give that one point to yellow, who's going to end the round with seven points, just by being in third place. Now, this is a more ridiculous scenario in the game, but it does actually suggest something that I think is very powerful that people forget to do in games. When you are in the lead, your goal usually is to play a little bit more on the conservative side because you have the most to lose by getting um, by fumbling anywhere along the way. Now, if you have an opportunity to keep pushing towards that end game state where where you can take your advantage and close everything out, you want to. And if you have to give an advantage to somebody, you're going to give the advantage to the player who is in last place. Now, of course, it's the responsibility of all the players to kind of understand what the circumstances are here sometimes you'll help out a player and you've just kind of misread the um the power of their board state and that can happen but fortunately in this very simple game that isn't the case and so this plus two plus one system um in this you know starting board state that we'd posited here now suddenly took a game that was pretty far apart seven six five three and put it to a very close nine eight seven seven um situation where yellow on their turn could go up to nine points and distribute a point to another player or just choose to king make red which that very much depends on what kinds of situation and tournament style you're playing in that's again its own entire video which we won't we won't talk about here but it leads to a lot of interesting circumstances and this idea of lifting up players who are below you to advance your own position is a very real choice that players do have the opportunity of making in a lot of games all right, let's suppose another game where all these players have, you know, an action on each other's turns. We'll start with red uh, or we'll start with yellow. And maybe even these actions are simultaneous uh, rather than uh, one by one, which is which is more likely given what I'm about to suggest to you. A player can either choose to gain two points or they can choose to gain one point per opponent who gained two points, essentially. And so uh, those who are choosing to score will get two, which seems great. Those who are choosing to pass, we'll call it, or, or wait and see or invest or whatever you want to want to name it, care about other people choosing point scoring things. Now, let's suppose that only yellow chooses to do this passing or investing or whatever you want to call it. That's the ideal situation for yellow because everybody else has chosen to score two points going from three to five. Yellow sees three people gaining those two points. Since they see three people, they score three points and they are going to go up to six. Now, this becomes a problem when other players start saying that they also want to do this passing strategy, this investing strategy, because in this instance, yellow, blue, and green have all chose to invest or watch, and red has just chosen to score the base two points. Red scores the base two points. The other players only see one person scoring points, so they only score one point each, putting them to four and red to five. This is just a game of chicken that I've posited here, and you might again say, well, okay, that's a little bit silly. Um, but it's not actually I mean one of my favorite games Great Western Trail very much players uh, move into certain strategies in that game and kind of paying attention to what um, heads or, or employees are available to you really really matters a lot in that game and so you might be the player who says I'm going to slide into this strategy or I'm going to kind of watch and see what the other people do generally someone who pushes like an aggressive ploy to go out ahead early has the opportunity to kind of slot into a given strategy in many games 
And then other players can choose whether they want to follow that strategy or do different strategy. And many games have a more powerful strategy um, that people are going to do. But if everybody is constantly doing this like investing or watching thing that I'm talking about, that's going to end up being bad for those players. But if only one player is kind of doing the wait and see game, then that player is going to get an advantage. And so that kind of dynamic does exist a lot in games where people choose either synchronously or not synchronously to move into certain strategies, and that can really impact the flow of the game. So it's something to be aware of, um, that being cognizant of how your uh, fellow players are going to play can... um, negatively or positively affect the, the flow of your point scoring in that game. I think the advantages of cooperation in multiplayer games work even if certain players are cooperating or not. I've cheated and I'm using the arrows here to describe players as either cooperative or confrontational or really neither. And so positing a game in which yellow and red players are choosing to be more cooperative in the strategies, blue is choosing to be more confrontational, and green is choosing to go their own way, Um, generally my expectation in this kind of game is that the cooperative players are going to wind out coming up on top. Now that's true mostly for Euro style games. Um, And the reason that is, is because oftentimes Euro systems build into each other that if yellow and red are doing this certain kind of strategy, it is helping each other. And even though blue is maybe spending some time trying to tear that down, Uh, it probably isn't going to be enough in the face of two players who are working together. There are certainly some games where the green player is going to, you know, kind of by being unaffected by the circumstances that are going on is going to rise to the top. There are some games, um, Evolution comes to mind, where the confrontational player is the one who's going to take advantage by just sort of being the only confrontational player. Uh, But I think that a lot of the times the way these systems work the way that sort of games have this feedback loop between your score and then the circumstances on the board. Players who are playing nicely with one another, um, trying to get out of each other's way, but enable sort of the same things, uh, are going to generally come out on top. Um, Playing nicely also and, 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 and meanly does not just mean like taking points or giving points. In you know, worker placement games, it means sort of slotting into different strategies at different times. So a uh, blue player might be confrontational because the, you know, one of the other players is choosing to take XYZ, you know, worker placement strategy. If we're talking about a feasting on Mr. Odin, uh, you know, it's possible that yellow and red have said, okay, well, I'm going to do this path. I'm going to do this path. It's like orthogonal. Um, so we're not going to bump into each other. Green is just kind of chaos all over the place. And then blue chooses a strategy that is directly confrontational with the strategy that red is choosing. They're both they're both going sailboats or um, whaling or whatever. And then yellow is the one who's really going to, to charge up. Now, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that by being the player who is cooperating, you might end up being the person that's hosed by a player who is playing a bit more confrontationally at at a table. And I think actually in a lot of uh, more competitive Euro gaming scenes, this is actually where some players start to get very grumpy. And I think they're wrong for that. Everyone has a right to play the game in whichever way they want to. Um, But usually at a certain level in a game, everybody is kind of trying to race at a certain way for, for a lot of games. And... Um, by bumping into someone and making yourself less efficient at the cost of their efficiency, the other players at the table have an advantage, and certain players, I think, take that uh, certainly in a pretty difficult way, which is is fair. Um, but that's why games are, are mostly for fun and, and not for competition, says the uh, says the board game player. I want to end my navel gazing ramble by talking about a game that I think exemplifies this in a wonderful way, and it's Terra Mystica. Um, This is a game that I've always loved, but I super played a ton of it during the pandemic, thanks to Port Game Arena and a really great community of folks that play this. Uh, But this game has cooperation and competition, and both of them really matter. This game does a very nice job of seesawing between those two things. I find that folks who are just getting good at this game tend to be far too confrontational. They um, aggressively dig into certain hexes and block other players off, and that can really matter. However, I think most of the time, players who are very good at this game, they tend to build up 
um, aggressively like next to each other. They are giving power, charge, and resources um, to each other, to all their neighbors. Being neighborly in this game is the way to win. Uh, and then the question that really challenges people who are of high skill in this game is, when do you elect to be non-neighborly? Um, but by being a player who has not chosen to play neighborly, you are going to fall behind all the neighborly players who are getting those additional resources from charging, from discounting the costs of their trading posts as they are building up around each other. And you are meanwhile trying to dig into a corner of the little world. This game is awesome because it requires you to interact with each other. It rewards you for interacting with each other. And only in very specific circumstances should you do so in a way that really puts somebody uh, down a peg. And by doing that, you need to pay attention to when do I think another player is going to knock me down a peg um, or is it a low opportunity cost to them like we talked about earlier in the video. Thanks for watching, everybody. Would love to hear your comments on it. I know it was a little bit of a navel-gazing kind of uh, video, but I enjoyed talking about it, so I'd love to hear your thoughts along the way. Uh, maybe I can look at a few games if there is interest, or you can weigh in on games that you think that cooperating or non-cooperation is just absolutely essential to making the game run. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye.